All right, audio is live. Matt, what's his last name? And Sweet. And video is live. Hi, folks. Where have you been? We've been waiting for you. Welcome to our Saturday night live YouTube workshop. What are you laughing about, Frick? We've been waiting. <laughs> We've been scrambling is what's happening. No, we never scramble. Interesting show tonight. We're, we're going to talk about finishes, or the uh, topic is finishes. So we'll handle anything that you throw at us. There's a, several questions that came in. Luther's uh, working through those. So we have, um, just to tell you who we got on board tonight, Jake's behind the camera. Frick is managing. Producing. Producing. I'm here. Rex is here. Security. Ken's here. Ian's beside him. And Megan is uh, socially remotely. Socially distance. Yeah, socially distance. <laughs> Megan is remotely uh, with us, she's checking on combat wounded vets that check in to say hello. I'll cover that in a second. Luther's he on with us. Is Super Dave? He was changing the oil on his tractor, so probably uh -huh. not. <laughs> Luther, uh, Colonel Luther, retired Colonel Luther, is out in Washington State. He'll be on there as well. You'll see him. Attending. Attending. Super Dave no, is attending. here. Oh, oh he's, uh, yeah. Luther is attending a three month course at the, um, what's the name of the school? Port. Port Townsend, Townsend Woodworking School. Um, so he'll, uh, you can ask him some questions about that if you want. What else am I forgetting? I think that's it. Oh, and, sorry. Super Dave is here. He uh, finished, Super he Dave finished is here. the oil change. Good. Special hello to Super Dave. Also, special hello to uh, Angie and Lynn. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. How, how many are, how are our numbers, Frick? So I can pace myself in terms of... 281. 281? Okay, we got to build before we can get to the end of the rest of that. So we'll start off. Have we got a question right away? Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay, this one comes from Kev O'Malley. Kevin O'Malley? Yeah, and he says, could you please tell about scrapers, sharpening scrapers, and sharp scraping between... <laughs> Pokes. <coughs> Rob mentions it often whenever sanding comes up, but I haven't found anywhere where he demonstrates his technique. Mm. Uh, okay, well, that is uh, actually a good question. So, the um, just I'm going to give you a peek, Jake, out here. Mm. So, in uh, conjunction with what we're doing tonight, I brought in I brought in several pieces of furniture that have different finishes on it. And we'll go through tonight and talk about them and just give you an example. Now, what, uh, the reason I did that is, A, to let you see what that particular finish looks like. B, some of those pieces of furniture were built back in the 80s. That'd be the 1980s for you youngins. And uh, see how it ages. And that might spur some conversation. But Kevin's question, uh, if you spray, nothing happens in one coat. For any kind of protection you need, no less than two, usually three to five. And oftentimes, in fact, it's just accepted that after each layer of spray, the, there's going to be some dust and uh, it doesn't really raise the grain of the wood, but it's not going to be perfectly smooth. So you've got to go in and you have to prep each layer of finish before you apply the next one. Most people sand with a very fine sandpaper. The problem with sanding is it leaves uh, a very fine dust. I use lacquer mostly, so it leaves a very fine white powder dust. If you're spraying something like walnut, where it's very open porous wood, then that fine dust gets down in all those pores, and it is a real struggle to get that out before you spray the next layer on. What I discovered accidentally, I don't know if I picked it, I don't think I picked this up from anybody because I don't ever remember seeing anybody else doing it. Jake, any idea where my scrapers are? They're not right here at my <coughs> fingertips. Uh, I used to actually prepare my scraper the normal way, which is have a little bit of a burr on it, but I discovered that it works a lot better in this, and it's less aggressive if you simply prepare your blade so that you're square on the end and smooth and polished on the side. Ken, you got one? Oh, thank you. Thank you. So here's my scraper, and all I've done is I have, I have straightened and polished the edge, and then I do the, a little strip right along here using a special little device so that you don't have to polish all of this. 
And then you simply go in, and between coats, you scrape that. Have I got anything here with finish on it? I don't. Shoot. I'd show you. It's pretty amazing the way it works. And, and sometimes it's really, it can be really fast. You're just dragging it over, and all you're doing is just taking a little bit of that top layer off, and it leaves it. The, yeah. <coughs> yeah, thanks, Ken. Good idea. We'll show you. We, we spray our shooting boards that we sell with, with uh, lacquer, and I'll, uh, I'll show you how that works. Anyway, it's on a flat surface. It's the fastest. It's this, and I think it's the best way to do it, too. It just allows you to go in and get it so precise. And you can get a scraper right into a corner. So if you're trying to... Uh, here, here, here. Thanks, Ken. Oh, the, just the one side's been... Oh, is it? Okay, so these are in the midst of being sprayed. So they've only been sprayed on one side. And Harold is the one that does it. He's going to have to come in here and, scra and, uh, and spray this multiple times so first of all you got to get right into the corner well trying to do that with sandpaper is difficult but with this you just simply go in there and then pull it out now Let's you see. can Let's you see. what this caper this is only <laughs> one coat and this is MDF so it's not a great example but that's all I had to do and there's and that's that's perfect perfect for prepping it for the next coat. Now there's a little piece of uh, um, torrified maple. You just get a little bit of dust off of it. It's fast. Oh my goodness, it's fast. As opposed to sanding. And you don't have dust in the air. It's the best way to do it, I think. All right, before we do the next question. So what we do in these uh, Saturday night workshops is do things, raise awareness for our Purple Heart Project and also raise funds so we can carry it on. What do we do? Well, six times a year under normal circumstances, we run a six-day class, very intense. We start the class at 7.30 in the morning. We go until 11 o'clock at night for six days. We teach traditional hand tool woodworking, everything from sharpening planes, chisel saws, to dimensioning a piece of rough lumber, taking something literally as it would come from the mill after it's been dried, and we make it flat, smooth, and square on all six surfaces. We actually build a piece of furniture with it. So no power tools at all. You learn dovetails. You learn um, through uh, mortise and tenon. You learn to handle and prepare and use your tools in such a way that you could buy, I hate to say a simple piece of furniture, uh, pardon me, you could build, and I hate to say a simple piece of furniture, but a, uh, basic. a, a basic piece of furniture with just hand tools. It's, every class has seven combat wounded veterans, so we put it out there that uh, if you are, have been wounded in combat, whether it's a physical wound or mental, apply to our program, and we accept, we will be accepting 36, 30, 42, sorry, 42 each year. We bring them in from all over. We cover their airfare, cover their hotel, we cover their meals, obviously their tuition. Every vet goes home with approximately $3,500 <clears throat> in premium tools, that's U.S. dollars. And thanks to Jack Lane and Chris Chahowski, we have what's called the Bench Brigade. And the Bench Brigade will build a bench, a regulation Rob Cosman bench, which is the same benches that you see me, we use in our classroom, and deliver it to their home so that they have that bench to go, out, go to work on. Um, if you would like to be a part of that, you can do two things. A, you can help us find the guys who need it. Guys, I say guys and gals. We've had both. And B, if you want to support it, we take we accept donations, and we're happy to uh, happy to allow you to participate. It's a fantastic program. The results are stellar. Uh, just um, I usually have a combat wounded vet come on each time we do one of these and tell it from his perspective, but uh, I didn't tonight. But we will resume that again in two weeks' time. And that's what all the stuff is behind me. So, without any further ado, next question, Frank. Okay. All right, this one comes from John Allport in the chat. Hi, John. He's near Belleville, Ontario. He oh, says, Canadian. He says, my late father finished a coffee table. I'd like to refinish it with the same look and feel. How do I find out which finish is on it, or does it matter? 
Well, <clears throat> um, so you're stepping a little bit outside of my leg, John, because uh, I don't refinish. In fact, I hate refinishing. That's, uh, that's uh, such a chemical process. I would suggest, so oh, it could be any number of finishes. <clears throat> oh, uh, how are we going to determine that? You could, you could use, the, you could do it this way. Find an area that's not shown and take lacquer thinner. And if lacquer thinner eats through the finish, then you know it's lacquer. Um, there's essentially two types of finish. There's an oil finish. We'll, we'll show you when we go out there. An oil, this is, this is uh, an oil finish. This is tongue oil. So it's applied with a wet rag or a brush. It soaks into, this is important, it soaks into the wood. You let it sit for a short period of time, depending on the, on the uh, weather at the time. If it's, if it's dry or cold, it's going to affect it a little bit differently. But you eventually wipe off the residue, and you, you end up putting multiple coats on. When I say multiple, six, seven, eight, before you finally get enough of a buildup that you get a protective finish. But it soaks down into the wood, and it'll enhance the color of the wood. Um, the other types of finish are things like this. This is just a spray can of it, but this is a lacquer. And this is what we would call a top coat, where it sits more or less. I mean, there is some absorption, but it essentially is a, a protective film that sits on top of the wood. And there's two different types. There's a lacquer. And the nice thing about the lacquer is with every additional coat, it melts together or it melts into the previous coat. So you don't end up with six coats, you end up with one thick coat. Each, each time you've reapplied, it's made that coat a little bit thicker. And then there's your urethanes. And what your urethanes do is they are essentially layered. So the first one goes on and dries. The second one adheres to it, but it doesn't melt into it like the lacquer does. And it builds up. I prefer this one. How are you going to tell? Well, <clears throat> could he, in an inconspicuous area, couldn't he just scrape at it? And if it's scraped yeah. away, you could determine yeah, if it was one or the other? Yeah, that's how you could determine if it's an oil or a lacquer. If you scrape it and it comes off in any kind of a, uh, any kind of a, uh, a, a film, then you know it's some kind of a top coat. But that's, that's a tough call. Well, but it, it might also just be worth, like, not trying to match what it is specifically, but either yeah, but determining wants, if it's one, oil or lacquer. I know, but I don't... adhere to it. Right. I just mean, but you could apply an oil on top of an oil. You can apply an oil on top of an oil, but you can't... An oil on top of any well, top no. coat is not going to do well, anything. I know, but you could apply a top coat to another top coat, right? No. No. I don't think your lacquer is going to stick to your uh, polyurethane. I don't know what you're going to do. But, as Jake mentioned, find an incon in inconspicuous spot and just experiment with a little patch. And if it adheres and it looks good, then go with that. If it doesn't, then you're going to have to change and do something else. But the, of the two finishes that I use, um, here they are. This is, this is wait, the... Wait, wait. What? Well, this might come up in the next question, so let's stay on target. All right, I'm staying on target. Good luck. Let me know how you make out. I'm sorry, I can't. You, you really need to have a finishing expert, refinishing expert. I just, I just do the stuff the first time around. <clears throat> Except when my kids destroy it and they have to redo it. Go ahead, Frick, next. All right, next one comes from Wes Brown, who's also in the chat. He says, the only, lac Hi, the only lacquer available in my area is labeled do not thin or not for spraying. Any recommendations of spraying lacquer sold in more reasonable quantities? Well, I would think, uh, okay, actually I was going to say you should be able to get anything anywhere, but... Uh, a lot of times they won't they won't ship anything like that where it involves air transport because of its uh, the danger. But if you're in Ontario, you certainly should be. How, we got this stuff shipped in, right, didn't we? How did they send Frick, this to us? Where's he located? He's Ontario. No, that was the last. That was oh, the last sorry, last one. So he's in uh, the U.S. He didn't say. Well, I'm assuming he's in the U.S. You should be able to get it. I would go. Where would you? Well, you can get death it? from Rockler. Yeah. Uh, Rockler hardware carries deft, which if you're talking about a small project, yeah, we got some stuff to announce here. If you're talking about a small project, boxes, anything, anything less than the size of a football, then this is the this is absolutely the best because uh, 
if you spray this stuff with a traditional spray gun, it has a tendency to blow things off the table. That's what I would use. And you can get that Rockler hardware. You can get that. <coughs> this is a professional product, so you're going to have to find a, a supplier. Um, some, any, actually, any store that sells uh, paints should be able to get something like that for you. And this is actually made in the U.S., a Chroma Pro. Jake can, Jake can zero in on the uh, label. You can write that down. And if you've heard me talk about this before, my attitude when it comes to finishing is just have two. Two, and get really good at them. Because you don't have time to experiment with a whole bunch of things. And I could tell you some horror stories about experimenting with finishes for the first time. Um, by the way, if you are a combat wounded vet, did we ever come up with a way of doing that, Jake? Megan? Yeah. What? Tag. Okay, hold on a second. Let me introduce it, and then you tell your thing. If you have been to our class... If you are a combat wounded vet that has been to one of our classes, we'd like to give you a shout out. So I need, I need you to let us know you're on. And last week, uh, two weeks ago, we had um, um, Jake, help me. Greg. Greg Harrison, who uh, I spoke to a year or so ago, and he, he, he spoke up three or four times and nobody noticed it. So Greg, if you're on there, Chuck, how do you do? Great to have you. How, so this is what, we, this is what we're going to have you do so that we, we recognize you, your name and you don't, it doesn't get float by without anybody picking up on it. It's at, you have to tag at and then Megan Cosman and then you'll be recognized. So does everybody understand how that works? So you just put the at symbol in the chat. You just put the at symbol and start typing Megan's name and uh, that way it goes directly to her. And Megan's name is spelt? M-E-A... G A N, M E A G A N. Is that right? Yeah. That's right. Okay, good. Hopefully, we'll see it. Anybody yet? <coughs> uh, we've had a few people view a few vets uh, say some stuff, but I haven't been watching for the ones okay. that have actually been in the class. Okay. Pardon? One combat wounded that hasn't attended the class. Well. Um, <laughs> He'll get his turn when we when he does get to attend. Just a quick COVID update. So we didn't we weren't able to have any of our classes in 2020. We've uh, postponed all the moves and moved them to 2021. I have no idea what's going to happen. Locally, we are in what's called orange phase. They just recently moved us into that because of the number of cases, which really is pretty minuscule. But they're trying to be overly cautious. Um, parts of Canada are completely locked down, so the border is closed. You can't come in, and if, if you, you actually you can come in, you can fly in, but you have to quarantine uh, for two weeks, which takes makes it impossible to do. We're trying to organize a local class for the middle of May, which would just involve, we had what was called the Atlantic Bubble. That means province of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland could travel, inter, interprovincial travel was not restricted. Well, that fell apart here about a month ago. So we don't know what's going to happen. We're just uh, hoping. We have a plan in place. I can't talk about it just yet because we haven't figured it all out, but it will involve the vets who have already been accepted. And, um, yeah, we'll give you more as soon as we get it figured out, which will be within the next month, I certainly hope. So next question, Frick. Okay. I'm eating cantaloupe. Um Okay, this next one comes from AC. AC? He's in the chat as well. In cases of matching wood colors to existing woods and furniture, is it okay to use stain, then use oil on the stain afterwards? Uh, most oils are compatible. You can put over top of a stain, which actually isn't a bad idea. Uh, it, not, a, it'll enhance the color, and B, I want to show you, I'm going to take you out there, I'm going to show you what happens to wood no matter what. Now, if you have... Um, any UV light coming into your home, which is daylight, it is going to affect the color of your wood. It is going to it is going to negatively impact it in some cases. And although there are finishes that has claim to have UV protection in them, I've never seen anything that really um, prevents it. It may slow it down slightly. So it's not a bad idea to uh, apply. A, I, I haven't experimented with this much, but I'm going to start, and you'll see why in a minute. Applying a walnut stain to walnut. I don't, I don't stain one wood to look like another. 
I have the attitude that if you want walnut, use walnut. If you want mahogany, use mahogany. But it might be a good idea to actually put a walnut stain on walnut before you finish it so that it maintains that deep dark brown color because if not, you'll see what happens. In fact, let's go out there now. Well, wait, but, <clears throat> why don't we talk about... Oh, what we got here? Well, we have enough people on. How many people are on? 692. 692, well, that's enough. Okay, so here's what we do. Every time we, we do this, Santa Claus uh, helps us out by uh, providing some of the gifts that we give away. For every $1,000 increment, and there's, there's no uh, obligation, but for every $1,000 increment in donations that we get, we, give, we, we draw, do a draw for a price, a big price. And um, you don't, in order, to apply, in order to sign up for the draw, link, is there a link up there, Frick? They'll throw oh. it tonight, they'll put a link on there, and you can go ahead and do it. So here's what prizes are tonight. Now, we have a good friend down in Southern California. His name is Ahmed. Amid. Amid. <clears throat> Some of us call him Ahmed. And uh, he made these handles and donated them. Jake made the chisels. So what we're giving away tonight are, are um, three. One, we do a draw of three, and we'll do more if we get more. This is an IBC chisel that has been ground to make a half blind. So in case you don't know what that is for, when you cut a half blind dovetail. Do I have one here staring at me, Jake, that I'm just not seeing? Nope. Have I got a drawer close by yeah. that has half blinds in it? There it is. Where? Keep on. Left. Those aren't half blinds. Don't walk oh, right here. Okay, thank you. So, when you cut the dovetail on the back, this is called a through dovetail. You see the ends of what are called the pins and you see the ends of what are called the tails. On the front, when the drawer is closed, you don't see anything. But if you look very closely, and I didn't uh, match the wood colors very good, but this you, does not go all the way through. That's called a half blind. So when I'm cutting this, I use my saw and I can cut right to the line on both pieces. It's actually really easy. When I cut this piece out, I can't have saw cuts coming through on this side, so I have to cut on somewhat of a triangle shape. And then when it comes time to chisel, on these, if you can imagine removing this material, this space in between these two pins, you just chisel from one side and chisel from the other side and it's done. But when you go to do this one, you can have to chisel from one spot. So we use a half blind that allows us to reach into the corner with one chisel. You can get on the right corner, you can get on the left corner. So, we make those chisels, it's called a half blind dovetail chisel. This one is African blackwood, and these are custom handles turned by Ahmed. They're finished beautifully, and they feel fantastic in your hand. Oh, compare them to the shape. Oh yeah, so, so we've, uh, we've played around with the shape to come up with something that, that uh, uh, just fits a little better in your hand. So there is the, uh, there's the, uh, the, I, the IBC chisel handle, and there's the Ahmed chisel handle. So that one is African blackwood. This one is pink ivory. These colors are not, are not enhanced. This is the actual color of the wood. Isn't that incredible? And this is cocobolo. Okay, gorgeous. He does an incredible job, beautiful. There's a rumor that we may actually at some point have these for sale, meaning these chisel, custom chisel handles. But for now, these are the prizes for tonight that we'll draw for. So there'll be at least three winners, and if we have uh, more donations than that, we'll have more. Now, we're also going to uh, draw to give this away, and this piece of, this is called intarsia, intarsia. And it's pieces of wood that are cut to fit, and they create a picture, but instead of it being a... Uh, marquetry where it is flat the intarsia means it has some shape so it gives it some depth and this is obviously a moose and this was made by mark why do you pronounce mark's last name sweet 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 and uh it's made out of butternut black walnut ebonized black walnut and poplar and thank you very much mark and he said and sent that in to help raise money for the purple heart project big heart and a big thumbs up to him what, oh, and we're also giving away tonight. We'll do a draw for the dead, the, the uh, famous dead cat sweater, thanks to Moose, 
at patsecretgarden.com. Uh, the hoodie, Captain's Always Right. And if you look on the side of the hood, it says, and I'm the captain. And then there's the infamous Naughty Girl t-shirt. Naughty, N-A-U-T-I. A lot of history there. And, the, and uh, Moose donates these to help us raise funds. And if you want one of these, particularly the Dead Cat sweater, which you'll never have anything on that's any warmer than that. It's incredible. Sometimes it's actually too hot when, and I'm talking about wearing it when it's... The other day it was... Three weeks ago, it was minus 14 Celsius. The wind was blowing, and that's all I ha had on outside, and I felt fine. Well, yeah, it depends. <laughs> so, if you don't, if you're not lucky enough to get one, go to patsecretgarden.com and you can order your own. And uh, tell them we sent you. Okay, you said it was more than a rumor. He's got 60 handles turned already. Oh. <laughs> I mean, okay, so let's go out here, and I'm going to show you some samples of some furniture, give you a little bit of history on it, and we'll talk about the finish, and hopefully this will draw up some interest. So we'll start right here. What? Losing you. Losing me in audio? Really? You okay. can't make it that far? No, I'll try it now. I just had to lift them up. Can you hear me if I'm out here? Yep. Oh, you're all right? Uh-huh. You got me? Yep. Yep. Okay. So here is a, um, a shaker, a shaker bench. Is this echoey for you, Fred? It's echoey for us, but a little bit, but anyway, we had too much furniture to put it all in here. So this is made out of pine. The legs on the bottom are birch. The back spindles are birch. This is cherry in the back. So this has been in my house for the last five or six years. It has a, uh, a lacquer finish. So a sprayed that lap finish that I told you about. And that's how it stands up. It's, if you can imagine a bunch of kids, it's wet all the time and being wiped down and it has still managed to uh, hold its own. Now I talked about colors. That was, that, that's cherry in the back and it was a much more reddish brown cherry but the light fades it out. In fact, it fades it out so much. Let me just show you this. Here's a, here's a chest of drawers that I did made out of cherry. So you can see how red that cherry is reddish brown this too is that lacquer and here's a clock that I did quite some time ago that's been in our front room which gets a ton of light and if you look at that you would not even know it's cherry it just it actually looks more like birch it lost all of its color you can't avoid having that happen so this piece has been sitting in a room that doesn't get a lot of light however it's certainly not the same color that it once was in fact, you know, I was going to say, I thought you could tell the difference from side to side. This has a figured cherry on the front. Sides are poplar. Bottom is, uh, is native uh, cedar, which is nice and light. And smells good. Um, let's, let's skip and go to. So we covered lacquer. Let's go over here. Did, did, did we do this out of oil, Jake? I thought we did, but I don't think we did. He certainly didn't do the top. We didn't. It wasn't. Here's an example. So this is, this is a Maloof-style rocker. Now, I made this way back in 1987. This is made as Paduk. If you know what Paduk looks like, it's orange. You would never guess it, but it gets completely bleached. Now, this has an oil finish. Um, there was probably eight or nine coats. I've never done put anything on since then. The finish is still there. It's still protective. I, I, I had to clean this off today, and you can wipe it, and it doesn't go right through into the wood. So people tend not to think of oil as being a very providing a very protective film. But this was Sam Maloof's own formula, and I remember I remember we had to cook it up. So it was it was um, there was boiled linseed oil, there was some beeswax. Can't remember all the things, but we had to do it outside, and you stir, and you cooked it up under heat and applied it, and it uh, it was. It was a great finish, and I think somebody actually eventually made it so it was available if somebody wanted to buy it. I tend to stick with the much simpler stuff. So we can come over here and look at this. This is a, uh, a piece of furniture, and this was made, this was finished with um, that tongue oil. And what I like about the tongue oil, particularly on walnut, is it just makes it look so rich because of the way it absorbs into the wood. This has multiple coats. I would guess and say this might have as many as 10. But it really enhances the wood. 
more so than the lacquer, I think. And if you look at that front, that is Claro Walnut. And it's just, uh, it's a gorgeous species of wood. And I think the oil does a lot for it. Now over here, this was a, some, one day I just felt like doing something that didn't require a lot of thought. I just wanted to cut some dovetails. So I did this little thing. I made it for a speaker, a stereo and speaker stand. And this is made out of pine. But I, I, I wanted to do something a little bit different. So I painted the inside, just for contrast, a flat black. And uh, it kind of set it off, and I like the effect. So I'm not big on painting wood, but in, those circumstances, in that circumstance, I like the effect of it. You've got the... the, you've got the uh, we are? Okay. Well, how are we going to do this? Is, is it a battery issue? No, no, it's, it's line of sight. It's your oh. through the wall. Well, does the receiver need to be stayed attached to you? Yes, it's very... Okay, try again. Well, I can, I can stand on this side and, and do it. Make sure Jake doesn't can stand. You, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. So that's paint and lacquer. Oil. Um, here's a desk that I made back in 1988. Yes, that was 1988. And this was uh, sprayed with a uh, product called um, Fuller Plast. And it was a catalyzed, I don't remember exactly what it was. It's not a lacquer and it's not a urethane, but it was a catalyzed finish. Very caustic. I remember the smell of it would kill you, but it was a great finish in terms of uh, how durable it was. And if you're going to do a desktop, that's going to get a lot of wear, so you need a really durable finish on there. And by the way, this is made out of a piece of ash, one big hunk of ash on the top, with walnut uprights on either side dovetailed in. The, uh, the drawer case... The drawer case is made out of walnut with ash dividers, recesses for your fingers. The drawers are made out of um, poplar and walnut. That's ash plywood on the bottom. And then these case, these, uh, these uh, drawer cases are sitting in a, in a dado underneath. And then there's four through wedge tenons up on the top. That's, how, that's what holds them in place. Of course, one on both sides. And then graduated drawers in terms of their size. The big drawers in the bottom are designed for files back when they used to have files. Everything's on computer now. And I, this was my desk for a long time. Unfortunately, I was bringing this back from a furniture show in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I was carrying it myself on my shoulder, believe it or not, walking up a, uh, walking up a retaining wall to take it into our house because I had to return the rental. Anyway, I dropped it. I didn't drop it, the wind blew, and I had to throw it. And it went six feet down, came crashing down on the driveway. But I repaired it. If you look real close, this corner got knocked off, so I had to inlay a corner in there. There's a big chunk over here that must have hit a rock. See there? There's a big chunk out of there and a chunk out of there. Couldn't really repair that, so I just put some finish over it. One of these broke loose, the joints broke, but I was able to put it all back together and glue it up. And anyway, it's Jake's desk now. Is that why those are screwed? Yeah, yeah, that, they, they broke. That piece broke through. It actually pulled those through wedge tenons through, which I was surprised at, but if you saw how uh, far it fell and how heavy it was. Um, what other piece that we should be talking about in here? This, this is a, this is, this, Oh, in terms of what color, what, what's going to happen to the colors of your wood, the probably the most dramatic, dramatic example is the Paduke, because it, would, it literally went from hunter's orange to, I don't even know how you describe that color, and that bleached out cherry. And the walnut here, it doesn't look so bad because it's been down in a room that doesn't have a lot of light, but walnut has a tendency to go almost a gray-brown. That's why whoever brought that comment up about staining ahead of time, I think might be an interesting way of maintaining color. This is, uh, this is a little series that I did, a uh, low table and an end table, and this is made out of birch. And in case you're interested, just to make it look a little bit different, I took a router to the dovetails after the fact, and I outlined them so it was all outlined with a V-groove. That was done after. I was just bored with the way it was looking. 
And of course, this is a piece that we just recently finished. And this is this is a lacquer finish on cherry. And uh, if you could, if you could reach through the camera and feel that, you'd understand why I'm so in love with that lacquer. How beautiful it performs. And this, this should be compared to the clock. Yeah. Well. So that that color of cherry, which is is pretty fresh, is what this used to look like. And the amount of work that it would take, if somebody's going to ask, well, what can you bring it back? Yeah, you could, but you've got to take off that outside oxidized layer. And when you're t trying to get up into spots like that, is it worth it? Nope. Nope. I'll make another one instead. Okay. Feel free to ask questions about that. We'll come back out if need be. Next question, Frick. <coughs> All right, got a few from the chat. First one's from Glenn Morgan. Hi, Glenn. He says, will a good wax seal the wood from expansion, and how strong is it up against everyday wear? So I, uh, that question gets asked a lot. So this is, this is Renaissance wax, microcrystalline wax. And before you get too excited, that little container costs $30. And um, Dale always called the wax, uh, used to make comments about people who use wax for a finish as it was just a, a get-out-of-town finish. It lasted about as long as it took for you to get out of town. So no, I would not ever recommend wax as a, a as just a finish. You can use it on top of a finish to help um, improve it, but as a finish by itself, I don't think there's I don't think you'll ever get enough buildup off of wax. I've never been able to to have it actually be a a legitimate finish that would resist everyday wear and tear and uh, liquids in particular, which is what's always most dangerous when it comes to wood furniture. Next. Okay, next one comes from Norman Olson. He says, do finishes, Hi, Norman. Do finishes apply well to resin impregnated wood? Uh, resin impregnated wood. Mm, what do we use? We're, what resin? Um, Mel. Well, you know what? Yeah. yeah. Our mallets are resin impregnated, and we uh, we spray them with the lacquer, and it holds up fine. I mean, other than the fact that it gets beat up from use, we've not seen any problem like that. Now, since you're talking about treated wood, what I want to bring up is this. We started using torrified wood. It's not resin impregnated. This is maple that has been, and you can get several woods torrified. So what they do is they take this wood and they dry it, and uh, they cook it in an oven at a temperature that would be hot enough to consume it, but in the absence of oxygen, it doesn't burn. But it turns it from, uh, from that color to that color. But it also makes it so that the wood does not absorb moisture. And you put an oil finish on there, it just it, it won't absorb at all. So I tried to put, when I first used this and actually put a finish on it, it just would not dry. You could not get, that would not penetrate at all. <laughs> I d haven't tried a lacquer, but I suspect that you could spray lacquer on there just because it doesn't adhere the same way the oil does. But I'll let you know after we try it. Next. Okay, next one comes from Charlie Charles McBride. Hi, hey, Charlie. <clears throat> Charlie or Charles? Charles McBride. I've always had issues with finishing end grain. It, it seems to always end up much darker than the long grain. Any tips? Yeah, long time ago, I remember, I can't remember the name of the company, so I'm just, you're going to have to do a search on this, but there was a product that you could get that would more or less seal end grain to prevent it from darkening, like op, uh, getting so much darker than the long grain or the edge grain. Um, I can't say that I ever remember actually trying it, I just remember seeing it and thinking, oh, that's interesting. I personally prefer... To have, particularly when you're talking about uh, drawers and wanting the end grain of the joint to stand out. But uh, I, I can't give you any specific advice on doing anything to the end grain piece of a wood that's going to make it look different than the long grain. I think it's just a characteristic of the wood. So you may have to either incorporate that into your design or try to find that product I was telling you about. And that's been at least 20 years, it may even been 30 years. But I know somebody made something that you could go in and seal in grain so that it would even out the color. And that's the best I can tell you. Next, Frick. Okay, next one comes from Jim Majera in Syracuse, New York. Hi, Jim. A, Been to Syracuse. 
<clears throat> he says, what can I do to open up the grain of the wood to absorb more stain if I'm trying to get a darker color? Oh, I don't know if that's possible. Um, well, uh, I don't sand wood. I try not to. I try to finish it right from the hand plane. But I know that um, stains work extremely well on sanded wood because of all those little fibers sticking out. So uh, maybe less uh, fine sandpaper. I mean, instead of going to 220, try stopping at 150 and seeing if that'll work. But my first instinct would be that if I wanted a stain, a wood to look darker, I would use a darker stain, unless you meant to say a finish and you weren't talking about a stain. So if we talk about a stain, we're talking about altering the color or enhancing or changing the color of the wood versus what it looks like if you simply were to put an oil on it, a clear oil or a clear top coat. So if you want if you want a darker look, then you just use a darker stain. But if I don't know what you actually meant. If you meant just how to make it look darker with your top coat, you could try applying the oil first, which will penetrate the wood and give it that wet look. And then after it's dry, applying your top coat over top of that. I'm going to experiment with that and see how it works. Next, Frick. Okay, next one comes from Keith Small in Northern Ireland. Hi, Keith. He says, on any occasion, if using oil as your finish, would you sand the oil into the grain of the wood on porous woods such as oak? What he meant to say, would I plane the oil into the wood? <laughs> right. Um... <coughs> Never heard of that technique. I, I, you guys need to watch my video on, on uh, preparing a hand plane blade in 30 seconds because you'll give up on sandpaper as soon as you do. Sanding, and, I, and I'm an anti-sanding almost, if you take any kind of magnification and look at a piece of sanded wood, it's going to look like a shag carpet. Regardless of how fine the sandpaper, it's going to look like a shag carpet. And you've got all those little torn fibers sticking up and that's why finishes adhere to it so well. I, I say that, merely stain does so well. In fact, I tell people, if you're going to make the switch from sanding and breathing all that dust to planing and having that serenity now feeling, you're going to have to experiment with your finishes because they may not look the same or react the same on a sanded surface versus a hand plane finish surface. And if you think about it, if you're a manufacturer of stains and finishes, are you catering to the hand plane crowd or are you plan uh, catering to the sanded crowd? And obviously the, turn the big crowd is the sanded crowd. So you just may have to experiment. But I'm not, a, I'm not much on, on sanding, so I can't give you a very good answer to that. So I'm not even going to try. Sorry. <clears throat> so a bunch of people are saying in the chat. I'm a plane snob. People are saying in the chat that uh, when their experience with cherry is that it turns darker with exposure to light. It does. It does. So let me tell you the cycle of cherry. You said it was it went lighter. Yeah. Earlier. Yeah. Here's what happened. Well, here's the truth. Listen for the cycle. Huh? Listen for the cycle. Here's the cycle. I'm looking for a piece of uh, fresh cut cherry. Ken, have we got any? Yeah. Ken has fresh cut cherry. Yeah, have you got a piece of that? Ken's got some really beautiful cherry. Local? <clears throat> yeah, North. So when you first cut cherry, and it's uh, fresh right off of the plane, not the sandpaper. I'm stalling. <laughs> you haven't said hi to Angie yet. Hi, uh, Angie and Lynn. Yes, I did. Did you? you missed it. I did say hi to them. Well, I, I was going to show a picture that... Uh, Thank you. That Ken wanted me to show of uh, the Christmas presents that she received. Are you doing it right now? Yeah. Oh, why don't you let me no. finish this question and then... That's not it. Let me finish this question and then we'll, we'll, we'll bring that up. Okay. So here's... Is that some finish on there, Ken? No. So here's a piece of, of uh, cherry that has been freshly cut. And it's kind of a... Almost a skin tone. Color, is it? Yeah. yeah. Sort of. Palm. And as it, as it oxidizes with UV light, it's going to get darker. Let me show you the color it's going to go to. Remember, I don't stain anything, so whatever I'm showing you is the actual color that it's going to go. So here's a, here's a good example. Okay. 
This has just got an oil finish on it. Oh, dust too. It looks different with the dust off it. So there's how, there's how it's gonna go. Now let's see if it's changed much. Well, see how dark it'll get? But if it is, if it is exp excuse me, exposed to UV light, strong sunlight. So our front room, our living room, has big vaulted ceiling and the sun just pours in there. And what'll happen, can we come out here for, Jake? Actually, let me bring that with me. It will completely bleach it. For all the cards. And you'll lose all of your color. So that's what it looked like. And with, with less light, that was the color at one time. Now this door got broken off, the kids broke it off. I brought it down here to fix. Um, this has been around our house for a long time. Now, yeah, well, oh yeah, there's a good example. Okay, so here you go. So same piece of wood, and, and this has got an interesting history too, because this is, um, this wood came from a veneer mill. This was what were called backer boards. So when they take a log and they slice veneer, they used to mechanically hold on to the log and they could only get so close to the, to the uh, jaws before they had to stop. And those backer boards were always the quarter on center section of the tree. It was beautiful wood. So there's the outside, there's the inside that hasn't had UV exposure and there's the outside that has had. So that's what happens to your cherry. Finish or no finish? Put it in the perimeter. Yeah. Yeah, well there's where the, the little lap of the door was on there. I'm telling you, the UV, it'll, so it'll do that complete cycle. It'll go from very light to dark, beautiful, and you're all excited. And then one day you look at it and you say you haven't been paying attention and you say, oh my goodness, it's all gone, the color's gone. That's what happens to cherry. Now, that's actually gonna give me a chance to pump my favorite wood of all. Walnut is gonna get a gray brown. It actually really goes ugly, it's terrible. Ash and oak and maple get a yellowed color. That's not very pretty. Um, mahogany actually tends, I, I haven't seen, I haven't seen mahogany bleach out. So that tends to hold its deep dark color. Uh, if you get something like uh, any of the rosewoods or cocobolo, cocobolo will just get so dark you can't even tell what it is. It just loses all of its color, just becomes dark. But the one wood that gets better with time and doesn't have a limit is pine. And Dave doesn't believe me. And Dave doesn't believe me. So my favorite is um, uh, nor um, white northern, pine, northern. North, north, northern white pine. It's just a beautiful wood. It's the one wood that can get beat up as a piece of furniture and not look bad. It's almost, uh, you expect it. And it gets this honey patina, and it just gets better and better with age. It's a beautiful warm wood. And people sometimes, pine, are you kidding me? No. you got to be a very good craftsman to work well with pine. It is so soft and requires such super sharp tools, or the fibers will crush. And you, it's got to be used in its right application, but um, it's a wonderful wood. So thank you for bringing that up on cherry. Frick, continue. Oh yeah, so let's let's bring Angie in, and you can show the person. So um, our T-shirts, Jake Rex, yep. grab me a T-shirt wrapped up, please. Yeah, Thank you. So here's oh, let's come show my show here. Come show. Me. This is my calendar, Angie. I got one on both sides of the shop, so you're never far away. This was the first day that I met Angie. So who is Angie? Angie is Ken's cousin. Angie is uh, about the same age as Ken. You're younger than Ken. She's been, uh, she's been because of a, a, an illness, she's been confined to her room for a number of years, but she is going to get better because we have a bench waiting for her for whenever she gets here. So, and Angie's sister, Lynn, uh, is her caregiver and has been ever since uh, their parents died. This is this, so that was the day that we went out and, and met. So we gave Angie a job. All of our T-shirts come nicely packaged like this. And you'll see a little sticker, and that's a picture of Angie and me, and that's the A for her seal of approval. So when you order a t-shirt, it'll come like that. 
So we have some incredibly generous people. I think of Jack Lane being one of them. In fact, we had a guy, so uh, Angie got all of these Christmas cards and presents. Who was the guy from Australia? Daryl Brook. Daryl? Daryl Brook from Western Australia. Daryl Brook from Western Australia sent Angie this big package of all of these uh, Australian items in there. Are you able to see it? Yep, yeah. it's on the screen now. There. So thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Jack. And I think she had quite a few cards, did she not? She had 10. Ten cards. So really made her really made her Christmas. You guys are fantastic. And we appreciate it. And Angie, you're fantastic. So she's she sits her pictures right up there in the back. She's always keeping an eye on me. She's our number one fan and also our number one employee. And when you do get better, we're probably gonna fire Jake and you'll take over for him. Now, don't forget to order a t shirt. Every t-shirt, each of the three t-shirts have a different saying on the back. This one says wood for good. And it has the uh, Purple Heart logo on the front. This one is Angie's color. She picked this color. This is wood doing good. Purple Heart logo on the front. And this was our original, thanks to Kramer. And that is wood is good. Wear it, somebody will ask you, and you can tell them all about the Purple Heart Project. And then if you're a combat wounded vet, you can go to our website, robcosman.com, and you can fill out an application on there to uh, be one of our scholarship vets. That's a little bit being held up right now because of COVID, but uh, we're not giving up on it. Okay, next question, Frick. Well, speaking of vets, do you want me to uh, listen yes. to you? Yes, yes. Have we had some? Uh, yeah. So uh, Eric Wagner is here. Eric? Jeff Wood is here. Jeff. Kevin Burris is here. Kev. Uh, Mike Chihote. Ch is it Cote? How, how do you spell it? C H O A T E. Chote. Chote. I always knew them by the first name. Mike. Uh, John Robertson is here from October 2019. Yeah. Jack yes. John, there's a bench coming to you. And his building. And who's his builder? Jake will find it for me. Keep okay. going. Philip Lawrence. Adam. Robinson. Adam Robinson is the volunteer, the civilian volunteer, that is going to build a bench and send it to, um, where's it going? John. They're both no, in no, North where, Carolina. Oh, North Carolina. Awesome. Hopefully you'll get a chance to meet. If you are if you are a combat wounded vet that has been to our class, make sure that's, I'm clear on that, We've had uh, 88 to date. If you're one of those 88 and you have not, you would like to have a bench. If you're one of those 88 and you'd like to do something nice for someone, please let us build you a bench. These guys are chomping at the bit to be able to do it. The uh, the civilian volunteers to procure the materials. We'll send them the vice and the bench dogs. They will build the bench as per our specs, and Jack will arrange and Chris to have it delivered and uh, usually done in person. And we've had, uh, I don't know how, how many we've actually had done, but it's a pretty good number. Somebody said to remind the vets that they can get video access to your tutorials online. Yes. So if you are a combat wounded vet, any combat wounded vet, and you would like to have a membership to our online workshop where we build furniture from start to finish. It's been going on for nine years, coming up on 10. Uh, it's 300 and, how much is it a year? 25. $325 a year. If you're a combat wounded vet, we give it to you with our thanks for free. Just have to, uh, how do they do it? Email David B. Nav <coughs> at yahoo.com. Who's David B. Nav? Super Dave. That's Dave? Super Dave's that? We didn't, so, give it, we didn't give him a Rob Cosman email? How come no, it's not I David? Don't affiliate him with him. <laughs> we got to fix that. I'll, I'll set up Super Dave at Rob Cosman. All right, do that, please. Uh, okay. So you just email Super Dave at Rob As soon as that's ready. How long does that take you? How long does it take you, Frick? Half can an you hour. Can you do it now? Half an hour. In half an hour, that'll be ready. Okay. Blast them. I got some more. Okay, who? Philip Lawrence from October 2018. Hey, Phil. Raymond Dorr from <laughs> October 2019. So I just got a Christmas card from Ray and his wife. Thank you, Ray. Uh, and Gary Burnett. Hey, from Gary. October 2019. Sneaky Gary's Pete. always with us. Sneaky Pete's here. Sneaky Pete is not one of our combat wounded vets, but he's always on. He's always there. And, and thank you for the nice, uh, he sent a nice card to Angie, did he not? Yeah, that was very nice of you. And uh, Ebby's here as well. Ebby? 
your brother all right anyone that's else now. that's it for now if you're on there shout out please gina's keeping track of it i, I don't see megan so <laughs> okay question uh okay i gotta flip screens here don't okay. forget if you want to donate the, it's on there you do it through our page robcosman.com they'll, they'll give you the link and uh, for every thousand dollar increment we're going to give away one of these chisels half blind chisels with the custom handles from Ahmed and a big thank you Ahmed they're beautiful I think I'll uh, put me down for a donation <laughs> okay uh, actually I have you see all of mine in the back they're all from Ahmed go ahead you ready yeah this one comes from Jay Yokus from Cincinnati, Ohio. Hi, Jay. He Been says, to Cincinnati several times. He says, are water-based finishes any less harmful than solvent-based oh, finishes? Oh, brother. Um, uh, one of my horror stories with wood finishes was a, a furniture show I was doing in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And I had a, I had a, uh, a, um, a three-piece set done out of ash and walnut, big dovetails on it, just really nice. And I finished it. I decided the night before to try this new water-based lacquer. Whoa, why, what a mistake. Totally ruined it. It was an absolute disaster. I have not gone back to water-based finishes. Y you know, it's uh, better the devil you know than the one you don't. I'm, I'm comfortable with lacquer-based. And maybe at some point I need to uh, start experimenting with water-based. But my experience, and that's early, that goes back 25 they're almost 30 years i'm sure they've gotten better but any water going on wood you know what that's going to do the lacquer based solvent the solvent based finishes just are so predictable so i can't answer i cannot give you your opinion but i will uh, i will commit to trying a water based finish again i've heard people talk about it and have great results but i can't speak from experience only had my one horror story frick Okay, this one comes from John Helfrick. Hi, John. From Los Angeles. And he says, I'm about to finish some furniture pieces for the first time. What are your thoughts on hard wax oil finishes, mainly products like Rubio, Monocoat, and Oz or Osmo? Well, I'll state my position again. If you're doing this for a hobby, you have to understand that when furniture was made by individual craftsmen, other craftsmen did the finishing he built it i finished it you use and that was a skill and a trade in and of itself so uh if you're doing this as a hobby where and you're trying to get good at the building process where are you going to find the time <clears throat> to experiment and get good at all of the broad ranges of finishes well, the answer is you're not so here's my solution find one maybe two finishes that you use exclusively find something you like that requires a bit of experimenting i know I'm kind of contradicting myself, but I found that an oil finish, and there's one in particular I like, I'll share it with you. An oil finish is the easiest. So if you have no skill, you're doing this for the first time, oil is the easiest. You wipe it on, just let it dry for five, 10 minutes, pay attention to what the label says, and then wipe it off. I will tell you this, that if it's a big piece, do it in, uh, in sections. Now you don't, when I say do it in sections, I mean you don't want to come halfway across to here and finish that first and then finish the rest of it because you'll end up with a line on there. So what I would do is I might finish the, all the sides all the way around and then when they're done, I might finish the top and then when that's done, I might do the underside. So we do it in, in nat find natural breaks. You put it on, you put it, you put it on, you take off the excess, you let it dry, you do it again a day later, multiple times, sanding a little lightly between coats, maybe even using some really fine steel wool with the oil on the steel wool, rub it with the grain and you'll just find that it'll really make the surface nice and smooth and take out any, any little uh, dust bunnies that may have dried in the oil. That's the easiest solution. If you're going to start spraying lacquer, that's a, that's a tough thing to get good at. When you spray, now we just recently did a video on spraying lacquer that, uh, can we leave a link down below? If, you, if you're not already uh, subscribed to my channel, subscribe to my channel. We bought two videos every week and we recently did one on spraying lacquer. And there's a, it's some real technique involved. You, you uh, I mean, I can't remember how many runs I had to deal with 
when I first started this. A run is where you put too much finish on by either stopping before you've released the trigger or going too slow or just having the gun set so it's throwing out too much product. And then all of a sudden the finish starts to sag and run. Now uh, you've got to go in and remove all that and it is a pain. I don't, I can't even remember, oh, I've done enough of it now. I can't remember the last time I had a run on something. I'll bet it's just been more than 20 years. So you will eventually get good at it, but that's a lot of gallons of finish between where you are now and where you'll be then. So what was the original question? Was it, a, if it was product based, meaning what do you think of this particular product? I can't say, cause I didn't recognize any of those names that you mentioned. Here's what I use. And you can find it in the US. I thought it was just sold in Canada. So for oil, this is tongue oil made by circa 1850. If you're in Canada, home hardware's carry it. Um, there's the, yeah, the website is circa, what's it say? 1850. Circa 1850.com. So I know you can get it. This is, the, uh, this is the lacquer that I prefer. Now, I've been asked, can you brush this on? You can. Now, here's what's nice about this. And I don't know if this is available in smaller quantities. I would assume it is. I buy it from a professional supplier, but I would assume that, um, for lack of a better word, civilians can get it. This is a, a lacquer that you buy it. It's pre-catalyzed, which means you don't have to do anything to it. The nice thing about it is you can actually leave it in your gun. It doesn't dry up on you. So with 40 gloss. So the number de determines the sheen. So I don't know, and I, unfortunately, I don't know whether zero is high gloss or 100 is high gloss, but 40 is close to being in the middle. And you can buy retarder, pardon me, you can buy flattening agent, which means you can customize it. If you want it to be really shiny, you can get it that way, or you can add flattening to dull it down to make a very matte finish. You can also buy what's called a retarder. And retarder is a liquid that you stir in, mix in with it, and that slows the drying. Sometimes you need that if you're in an environment where uh, it's warm and dry, the finish will dry very quickly. And the problem is if I was spraying this bench, by the time I'm, uh, by the time I get to this corner after spraying that side, that side is already dry and now you're getting overspray on it, which leaves a rough surface. So you can add this retarder, which will allow the finish to level out. I would suggest that if you're going to attempt to first learn to brush this on, you're going to want to have some retarder so that it will level better. The problem with applying lacquers that are intended to be sprayed is they have really quick drying time. And when you're brushing it on, you need that needs to have enough time that it'll level out all those brush strokes will go away and blend in and be one nice level surface. And um, that is the reason why you want some retarder. So those are the two products that I can comment on. The third one would be the Deft, which is applicable for smaller, although you can buy that, you can buy that in a can like that as well, but I use it in a spray can. So as far as brand goes, those are the only three I can comment on from experience. Next. All right, next one comes from uh, Michael Delvoy in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Hey, Michael. He says, how do you finish uh, kitchen cabinets so the finish holds up easily, holds up and is easily cleaned? Does one paint, polyurethane, lacquer, oh. or some other type of finish? Really good question. Oh, boy. Um, I say, oh, boy, because I've had experiences where the finish wears off. If, you're, if your cabinets are uh, solid wood or plywood, but they're a clear wood finish, you have to have a lacquer that is durable enough to withstand water. Now... This is the, at least, and I'm telling you it's 20 years old, but this was the only lacquer that was certified for use in kitchens. It gave enough water resistance that you could actually use it on kitchen cabinets. I did a set of cabinets for a friend out of Cherry, and the lacquer I used back then wasn't. I didn't realize it. And anywhere near the stove where it had steam, anywhere near the, counter, or the sink where it was going to be get wet, just was all water spotted. I remember the finish just literally fell off around the stove where the moisture from the steam just destroyed it. So you're going to have to do a little bit of research and find out what products are water resistant and will wear or stand up to the constant cleaning. Paint, 
I've never been a fan of painted cabinets, but it, you, um, I would suggest that you go, whoever you buy it from, make sure that it's being sold as a product that can be used on wood in a kitchen environment because that would be the toughest. All that furniture out there, none of it would be exposed in a year to the amount of use and abuse that kitchen cabinets would. So it's it's a specialized product that you want if you're gonna have it last any amount of time. That's a good question. And I really, I'm not the one to answer that because I don't do kitchens anymore and I never did them in a big way. And uh, so I never, I never got into that side of it enough to really tell you. Frick, I uh, just got a couple more vets we'd like to shout out. Shout out. Who would that be? We have Josh Briand here. Hey, BC. Josh, brother, Canadian. Sean Pedler. Sean, second Canadian. Josh and Sean were in the same class. They were Canadian number three and Canadian number four. We've had. We only had four Canadians out of the entire ones. Same class, good guys. Sean is uh, military police, and Josh was uh, artillery. Uh, Joe Bright's here. Joe Bright. Oh, I'm getting sweater up. Joe Bright, salt of the earth. Brother, how are you? Um, hope everybody in the family is doing fine, and you too. Uh, Josh had an injury recently. Got a nail to the head. Josh? Joe. Uh, uh, Joe. Uh, Jake Troll is here. Hey, brother. Jake, up in Minnesota. Up? Up? Yeah, he's north of us. Yeah. Well, it depends. It's cold. We're warm. And uh, Sean McDermott. Is here. Hey, Sean. Sean's just recovering from, uh, he was septic. His uh, gallbladder broke. So he's on the mend. He's getting taken care of well by Angela, his wife. Okay. Question. All right, next question. Uh, okay. Oh, shoot, I had one here. Arthur Anglin, he's in the chat. Hi, hey, Arthur. He says, what are the best ways to apply lacquer without a sprayer or other inexpensive ways to apply? Well, I, um, I just went over that, but I'll, I'll add something to it. You can do a roller, and they make a special roller that's got a really, really um, short nap. So the, a roller has little hairs on it, right? You don't want long ones. Long ones are for a rough surface, but if you're, if you're rolling a, a lacquer, you want a really, really short nap. But you're going to want to, whoever's selling it to you, you need to ask them, tell them that you're applying it by brush or by roller so that they can give you a lacquer that will have a slower drying time. I mentioned the fact that this lacquer, you can buy, a re, it's called a retarder. It's just a clear look, liquid that you apply and it slows the drying process. The reason, want you, the reason you want the drying process to be slow is when you apply with a brush, the little hairs in the brush are going to leave lines. And you want those lines to level all out so they're nice and smooth. You don't want lines in your finish. If your finish dries too quick, it, does that, it dries before it levels out. So make sure, wherever you go to get it, that if it's a lacquer, you want it to be brushable. Or get a retarder. Okay, next one comes from Ronald Hop, Hoppy. Hey, Ronald. In Glendale Heights, USA. Arizona. Illinois, I think. Illinois. How long between use slash multiple coats can you leave a finish in a spray gun without cleaning it? Well, um, we don't, no, but we're using ours all the time. Um, I would say, you know, you would be, it would be measured in months because, uh, I mean, I've left that in the can. And even if it does, the nice thing about lacquer, here's another reason to buy lacquer. If, you're, if it does clog up in your gun, you simply take the gun apart, put the parts in a can of lacquer thinner, let it sit for 10 minutes, and it'll soften up with the lacquer, and you can clean it all out, and you're good to go. But I've left my lacquer in cans for, I know, months, and it was still sprayable afterwards. And Sometimes it would get a little crusty right at the tip, but you just, you know... Pick that off and, and you're but good to go. But the lacquer also melts itself. Yeah, that's what, that's why I say the lacquer thinner dissolves that and makes it, it's really easy cleanup. So lacquer is, is good for being able to leave it like that. And I'm not one, I can't imagine every time you fin uh, you spray, you got to go through the process of cleaning your gun out. Oh, what a pain. 
So I I look for something that can stay in the gun without a problem. Our gun back there never gets cleaned out. It just keeps getting added to. Right, Ken? Right. I would never be one to clean my mess, would I? No. See? Not your nature. <laughs> Go ahead, Frick. All right. This is mash question. Whatever. Oh, mash question. Go ahead. All right, comes from hit me, Tom Highway. In the Hi, chat. Tom. Do you know another one or two ways Klinger tried to get out of the army besides cross dress cross dressing? Well, he tried to fly out uh, on a kite with his big pink fluffy slippers. Um, how, crossed, oh, how else did he? One or two ways. Well, he tried to eat a Jeep. That didn't work. He got him. That's that's my two. He tried to fly out on his kite, and he tried to eat oh, a Jeep. Oh, oh, and he wore the parka in the summertime, and it was super hot I, <laughs> in exchange for a Section 8. Well, that was the, the question was besides a Section 8 or cross-dressing. No, 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 no. Besides the cross-dressing. This was going to get him out because of the... An agreement he had with Colonel Potter, if he could last 25 Oh, hours. right, right, right. And he, and he sat up on top of the uh, flagpole for a long time. That didn't work. And then he was the only one that stayed in Korea at the end, married a Korean. Go ahead, Frick. Hey, by the way, if you haven't applied for the draw, here's what we're giving away tonight. We have half-blind dovetail chisels at Jake Ground this afternoon. They are fresh. And these are limited edition. Yeah, very limited. They're half-inch, whereas we normally still do five-eighths. And these are handles that have been donated, turned and donated by Ahmed down in Southern California. African blackwood, pink ivory, cocobolo. Gorgeous handles. All you got to do is put your name in the hat and make it picked. For every $1,000 increment that we get, Total in uh, in uh, donations, we will uh, do a draw for one of these. We're also drawing for the Dead Cat Sweater, the Naughty Girl T-shirt for that special person in your life, Rick, and the uh, Captain's Always Right hoodie. If you want one for yourself, you can go to... Oh, yeah, thanks, Ken. You can go to huh? patsecretgarden.com. Moose is a good friend of ours. He supports our program, so we try to always help him as well. Now, I asked you folks to help me make the Christmas for two World War II vets that we featured. And uh, Herman DeMio was on. Herman is um, a survivor of, of uh, D-Day plus four, fought across the hedgerows of France, was captured and spent the last year of the war as a POW. Came home, raised his family. He's still he's still uh, kicking. He lives in New York, and um, his son John brought Herman to our attention. We had Herman on. He actually, we were able to find out Colonel. Oh, you got to see that. If you hadn't, you got to go back and watch that episode where we were able to present Herman with his Bronze Star. And Bob, and Bob, how to pronounce Bob's last name? Harris, Harris which just doesn't look like that when you read it. Bob was a tail gunner in a Liberator, uh, 40, 40 missions, shot down on his 40th mission, captured, spent three or four months as a POW, and Bob is 99. He and his wife, his wife contacted us, and we did a special on Bob as well. And I asked you to send them a Christmas card to show them our appreciation. And I want to tell you that Herman received over 100, I'm looking at my notes, a hundred Christmas cards. We're gonna. We have a little clip of him saying thank you, and Bob received over eighty-five. Somebody here screwed up on Bob's on posting Bob's address. We don't know who it is. We don't. So some of you may have gotten the wrong address, and I uh, I apologize for I apologize for Frick or somebody for getting that address wrong. Because I, I think you got some bad you got some bad intel, didn't you? Well, I thought I copied and pasted it from Luther's email, but so uh, you did get bad intel. I, I don't know. I. You know what Luther says? <laughs> a general is only as good as his intel. Yeah. There you go. I, I prefer uh, Super Dave's motto myself. If you wait to the last minute, it only takes a minute. So, have we got? Have you got Herman's? Uh, well, I don't know if it's going to work for me or not. Let me try. Try Thank it. You for all the cards. This is Herman DeMio. No, it didn't. Uh... Can you just do it on your phone and 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 video it? Sure. So we, at least we have that. Call us as soon as you get it. No, I got it. You got it right there? 
Okay, it's, it's, Jake, it's, can it's you? Very, uh, it's very short. So am I. You got it? Thank you for all the cards. You can see them. He's got a huge pile there. If you're on tonight, Herman, thank you, brother. Merry, happy New Year. And Bob and your wife, thank you to you. Happy New Year. Appreciate you guys a ton. Uh, Super Dave would like to comment on your preference for pine. Uh huh. He refers to it as Northern White, soft on sharpening my chisels, pine. Northern White, soft on sharpening my chisels. On sharpening my chisels, pine. Pine. Tell him to go back to the tractor. <laughs> Next question, Frick. Uh, this one comes from Jake Tarola, actually. Hey, Jake. What's he got to say? Jake Tarola from Minnesota says, if is using spray lacquer in high-touch areas, like the plain tote or the handle, good, bad, or indifferent? Ah, good question. I would... Uh, so... Jake's asking, oh, here's my five and a half, so you know how much it gets used. Is this a good place to put a lacquered finish? Well, you can see how mine is worn, where my hand gets around there. But this has got a lacquer finish on it, and it seems to be holding up just fine. So I would say yes. But that also, that also is, uh, hinges on uh, how many coats you apply. If you're only putting one, two coats... You, you may as well spit on it because you've got to put as much protection. You have to build it up five, six coats in order to get any kind. Remember, when you're applying lacquer, every coat just makes the first coat thicker. So if you want some good protection. Yeah. Totes, I, I'm surprised I didn't oil those. But they are, that is a lacquer finish on there. What, what have we, uh, we, chisel handles be the same thing. So this chisel handle I know was oiled. And it probably had uh, four or five coats. Now, I would expect that'll get dirty with use just because it's the nature of an oil finish. Remember. Yeah, because oil leaves the pores open. Well, I'm, I'm actually touching the wood. And uh, on a top coat, I'm touching the yes, finish. Is. is wax considered a top coat? Um, uh, wax is a get-out-of-town finish. I don't know how I don't know how you would class it. I don't know the wax sits well, on. I, I think wax does sit on the surface. Because Ahmed Ahmed uses carnauba wax. On does he? Well, that's that's pretty hard. And he sent the chisels out of town. Yeah, that's why. So you're touching the finish if you use a lacquer. You're touching the wood if you use an oil or a wax. Next. Uh, okay, so the next one comes from Bob Mack in the chat. Hi, Bob. He says, how do I prevent dark blotches using walnut stain on light color woods like pine hand planed? Uh, so that goes back to what I'd said earlier. If you remember, any, any manufacturer of stain is making it for wood that has been sanded. Nobody is saying there's enough guys out there hand planing their wood that I'm going to make a product for them. No. So you have to adapt that means you're going to, if you're going to use stain and you're going to put it on a plain f surface, you're just going to have to play with it to see how it applies because it's not going to adhere the same way. Remember, that sanded surface just looks like a shag carpet up close. All these little fibers and those little fibers will grab that, soak up that finish and it makes it pretty uniform. When you hand plane that surface, it does get blotchy. Is there a solution to it? I've never found one, but then again, I don't use stain. I don't stain anything. I use, if I want a dark finish, I use dark wood. If I want a light finish, I use light wood. So I can't comment on that because I never do it. And uh, I can comment on putting a lacquer or an oil on a hand plane finish works just fine. No problem at all. But I, sorry, I can't comment on the stains part of it. Next comment. Am I answering any? Seem to be saying no, I don't know. An awful lot. All right, next one comes from Marcus Paul. Hey, Marcus. He said, earlier you mentioned a light sand between oil coats, maybe a little oil impregnated steel wool. Question, could you light plane between coats? Uh, I don't think so. You'd take, you'd take the top coat off that has the oil in it. No, I've never... Uh, I, uh, 
Now, I will tell you, I'll tell you a quick little story about a hand plane, what, what the advantages of a hand plane surface. So, do I have a shaker box here, Jake? Oh, did you take that home? Yeah, I got one right here. I got one right here. So, I have a friend, his name is Brent Rourke. And uh, he's actually your mother's. Brent makes shaker boxes. Yeah. Brent makes shaker boxes. So, when you make a shaker box, yeah, it's I'm made. Gonna, I'm gonna shake oval boxes. This is a shaker oval box, yeah. The outside, uh, the, the box itself is made out of a thin piece of wood that looks to be, oh, it's a little heavier than a, th it's probably three thirty seconds of an inch. So that strip, they, uh, they sa he sands them, runs them through a thickness sander, which that's a thickness planer. A thickness sander replaces knives with drums that have sandpaper on it. Sands it all down. And then you put that strip of wood in a, a vat of very, very hot water. And the hot water softens the lignin, which is a natural, natural glue that holds wood fiber together. You wrap it around a form and you use surgical tubing to hold it in place. That's what he does. And it dries. And when it dries, the, the natural lignin glue uh, repositions the fiber so that it holds its shape. However, after having this immersed in water, having been sanded, he would then have to go in and re-sand because water on a sanded surface is going to cause those fibers to rise and it feels really rough. Well, he sands it twice. So we were doing a video together one time and uh, every procedure that he did with a power tool, I would do with a hand tool. So when it came to preparing the piece of wood, I said, well, I'm going to hand plane mine. And he, I remember him rolling his eyes thinking, whatever. So, and you might be saying, well, how do you hand plane a thin piece of wood like that? You put a piece of double-sided tape down and stick it to it and plane away from it. And it works fine. So I hand planed that piece of uh, cherry, I think it was. And it felt like silk. It was beautiful. Put it in the water he, with the hot water, took it out, wrapped it around the form, dried it. When it came back... I didn't have to do anything to it. It was as smooth as it was when it was wet. Huge advantage to hand planing. Made him rise, raise his eyebrows. He went from raising his eyebrows to uh, opening his mouth and going, wow. So, what was the question? It was staining with hand planing surfaces. Oh, oh yeah. Um, so I wouldn't, uh, I would not try to hand plane between coats on an oil finish. And typically your hand plane finish is not going to leave anything to be taken off, I don't think. We talk about, we talk about taking your steel wool to, actually, now I have to back up a little bit. So what I've said is after you've applied oil and it's dried, sometimes there'll be, especially on something like walnut, the oil will have a tendency to bleed out the pores and it'll leave a little hard dot where a little blob of oil has dried. And you gotta get that off. And uh, I find the easiest way to do it is to take really fine steel wool, use, put some of that oil on the steel wool, almost as a lubricant, and you got to go over the entire thing and hopefully get rid of those little nibs. I would not go back and try to plane those off, if that was your question. Okay, next, Rick. Okay, next one comes from Steve Lukaser in Washington, D.C. Hey, Steve. He says, do you paste wood filler or I grain? I was married in D.C., do you paste wood filler or grain filler as part of your finishing process? If yes, do you use it on all woods or just certain wood species? And can you describe the product and process that you use? Okay, so a um, little bit old school. Back up just a little bit, Jake. I'm just looking to see if there's something I forgot. No, okay. So woods like mahogany, oak, particularly red, walnut, on uh, when I say old style or old school, this is going back into the 60s and 70s when those dark woods were popular. If you put a top coat like lacquer on on raw walnut, meaning you've sanded or, or finished or planed it, those pores will uh, the finish will go down into the pores, and you'll always have some texture. I'm not going to say rough, but you'll always have some texture on the dried finish. And the look that they wanted back then was to be glass, perfectly smooth. So you took what was called a filler. Uh, I don't remember what the filler was made out of. It was kind of a pasty. And um, the way Dale used to do it is he would mix a stain in with the filler. So now your dark 
brown filler was going to go on your dark brown wood, which was walnut. And you would, you would it was uh, the consistency of um, cake batter when you're making a cake. And you would white, you would you would uh, put it on with a brush, and you would go both ways to force it down into the pores. And when it dried, or when you next treated it, it was kind of in a rubberized form as it dried. So you wouldn't do a very big area because you had to, you had to remove the excess in this rubberized form. And you removed it with burlap. So once a section got tacky enough that it wasn't going to be wet, but it was kind of rubbery, you would take a piece of burlap, and it was a lot of elbow grease, and you would polish off all of the excess, leaving the pores filled. Now what, would, what it would do is it would take an open porous wood like oak or walnut, and it would leave it glass smooth, and then you could put your finish on there. It's a lot of work, a ton of work. Uh, I, am, I hugely favor leaving the wood with that textured finish if you're going to use an open porous wood. I don't remember the brand. I did that uh, back in the 1980s. Have never done it since. Actually, no, that's not true either. I did do it once, and I remember buying it. And I, if I remember correctly, you bought it locally. It was just called wood filler. Not to be mistaken with this type of stuff that you might use to cover a nail hole on trim. It was a wood filler. It usually came as a neutral color, and you would have to apply a stain, mix a stain with it to match the wood that you were going to use it on. You wouldn't want a white filler on a piece of walnut. What was the rest of the question? See if I got all of that. Uh, do you paste wood filler or grain filler? So hold on there. So no, I don't do that anymore. I much prefer to just leave it a textured finish. Next, rest, uh, next well, part of it. He said, if yes, do you use it on all woods or just certain wood species? Yeah. So you only had to use it on woods that were open pores. And the big three would have been oak, uh, walnut, and ash. Uh, and ash. Yeah, but you could have, yeah, hickory, yes, you would use it on hickory, white oak, possibly, but you certainly never, you would never use it on maple or, or cherry because they're closed pores. They don't have, they're smooth. Next question, Frick. Okay, this one comes from Joe Bright in San Diego. Joseph. He says, what are your thoughts on using an HVLP gun? Joseph is a hero, by the way. Just thought I'd let you know. What are your thoughts on using an HVLP gun that attaches to a normal air compressor for doing finishes versus using a turbine HVLP? Any suggestions for brands of both? Leave it to Joe to ask the question. I haven't got a clue what he means. Um, Joe, I mean, you're, you're stunk, you, uh, you stumped the dummy on that one. Because an HVLP stands for uh, high volume, low pressure, whereas a siphon gun which was what was popular before, is your compressor uh, uh, ran your gun, and as you pulled the trigger in the gun, the air going over created a siphon that pulled finish up underneath from the can down below and dispersed it. So you had, yeah, whatever. And it just created a lot of overspray. So supposedly the HVLP was designed to reduce the overspray. I can't honestly say that that's true because... When we spray, there's a ton of overspray, so maybe my memory's bad, but uh, I don't think it was much of an improvement. Supposedly, the HVLP uses less finish. So in other words, more of what you spray actually goes on the wood as the old style. But to have to cross the two, I don't know how that would work, so. Well, they make them now. Huh? They make them. You do? You know that? Yeah. Well, why don't you answer that question? Well, I don't know anything about that. I didn't, know, I didn't so, know they made such I a thing. I think it was uh, Katz Moses. He, uh, he showed some $50 HVLP gun. Yeah. I don't know, Joe, but I just bought one. But And, and uh, you know, it's the same old thing. You get It's nice to stick with something you're used to. So the company, the Turbinair was the company that I bought. My first, uh, when I first switched, and this is going back, 15 years, when I first switched from using a Davilibus gun, which was a siphon gun, and I switched, I bought, a, it was Turbinair was the name of the company, it was out of Quebec, but they've since gone out of business. Now that gun fell apart, I had to replace it with a gun made by 3M, which was a really nice gun. That broke, and I recently bought a new Turbinair 
from a company in Ontario named Federated Tool that actually had one of them still in inventory, even though the company's been out of business for five years. So I bought what they had left. So I'll survive another five to 10 years without having to switch to another one. But sorry, Joe, I, I don't have a brand name for you because the one I just gave you is no longer in business. Nice try, Joe. Next. Okay, next one comes from Mike Miller in Tucson. Hi, Mike. He says, how far do you sand in grits when sanding between coats? Well, if you're, if you're talking about sand, if you're talking about sanding instead of scraping in between coats on your lacquer, you only use one grit. And if I'm finished, if I sanded the finish, pardon me, if I sanded the wood up to 320, then I don't want to use anything less than that on my finish because it's inevitable that at some point in sanding between coats, you're going to accidentally sand through the finish and hit the wood. Well, I've prepared the wood with 320 grit and then I use 220 grit on the finish and I'm going to put 220 grit scratches on that 320 grit finish or wood. So use the same grit or higher that you finished your wood with. And that's when you're going to be converted to using a scraper because the other thing I've neglected to say is when you sand the finish, the paper clogs up and you're constantly having to change it. And just the dust alone is a pain. The scraper is so much... What well, You've seen me do enough, Jeff. How much oh, faster? 400, 500%. It's, it's just crazy fast and so good. Now, you've got to prepare your scraper properly, but it's easy to do. It's yeah, easy. There's, also, there's limitations. Oh, here, let me show you. Let me, I haven't demonstrated anything. Let me show you how I do the scraper. But, but you should mention that there obviously is limitations. Yeah, if you've got a round surface, you can't do it. So here's how I do it. Um, I have two tools that I use. And we're gonna, I'm actually going to offer these for sale. This is made out of torrified wood, so it doesn't change shape. So I... I, I see this so Still square. So this is just a piece of wood that's going to allow me to uh, to hold this. So I'm going to start on the coarse stone, and coarse in this case is 500 grit. And I take my scraper and I hold it like that. And all the block of wood does is just hold it so it's standing plumb. And as I'm moving it forward and back, so the wood, the reason I use a piece of wood is it's not going to wear out my stone. Now, I don't just keep running like this. I switch. See, I'm using the entire surface of the stone, and I'll just, now I'm squeezing it together, and I'm also putting downward pressure with my left thumb, and I'm just moving this, wiggling it. I, I'm not wiggling it. I'm holding it like that, and then as I'm pushing this, I'm rotating it, so I'm using as much of the stone as I can. And I'll go all the way through until I've got a nice smooth surface, but it's going to be coarse because I'm using 500 grit. And I can tell when I'm done because that will be a matte gray. And I usually put my magnifiers on to see. When I, I've got a consistent matte gray finish end to end, then I will switch to my 16,000. I find no reason to go to in between stones. See you, Ian. Thanks for coming. I'll go to my 16,000 and I'll do the same thing until the edge of that scraper is nice and shiny. Keep the hone right on there just to lubricate it. Okay. So when that's nice and shiny, then I just got to do the strip. Now, every instructor I've ever seen that talked about how to do the, this edge, because remember, a cutting edge, both surfaces that make it up have to be polished to the same level, or else your edge can only be as good as the uh, lesser of the two. They would, set their, they would set it down like that, and they would move it back and forth. But, you know, this little thin piece of steel, you're only putting pressure underneath where your fingers are. So I came up with this idea. Thank you. So this is a block of, uh, we go, we're going to make these out of, out of the same stuff. This is a piece of MDF with several coats of paint on it. And I've got three powerful magnets in there. 
And what I do is I put this on like so, purposely held back so it's not the same width. And then using my steel rule, this is the Charles ruler, Charlesworth ruler trick applied to a scraper. I set that on there like that. Now what that is doing is it's keeping, it's keeping me from having to have all of that touching the stone. The only part touching the stone right now is right out there at the very edge. But by pushing down on this and the fact that it makes contact here, this is going to bend ever so slightly so that as I move forward and back on here, I'm going to end up with a little polished strip right along this edge that will meet up with the polished strip on the end of the scraper that I just did with this device. And in record time, I have a prepared scraper for scraping my finish down in between coats. Now remember, I did not turn a burr. I just used a square edge. I used to turn a burr, but it could be too aggressive. It doesn't need to be aggressive in order to do the work we want it to do. So should you have done the other side as well? Like well, yeah, I would do the other side as well, so you've got two to work with. I was just showing you the process. And that's I all. Would, that's I mean both need. sides of what you just did. Yeah, I would flip it over and do the other yeah. side. So I would do I would do one, two, three, four, and now you've got four sharp corners to use. A corner. You're not really not creating a. Well, I guess you are creating a cutting edge, and I, it typically is not going to work on a piece of wood. But all I wanted to do is just knock off those little dust bumps that happen in your finish. It's really quick, really easy to do. It's so fast. Try it. You'll love it. You'll never go back to sanding a finish, like I said, unless you've got a curved surface where you're going to have to sand. Next, Frick. Okay, next one comes from Bart Thomas from Roanoke, Virginia. Hi, Bart. What is the best film finish for larger surface, such as coffee tables and desktops? What is the best? So what he means is, is a top coat. Well, uh, um, you know, you, you have to make sure that you have resistance to whatever it's, the surface is going to be subject to. So if you uh, consume alcohol and you're going to get alcohol on there, you better make sure that it's, it's, uh, the finish is resistant to alcohol. If it's going to be water, make sure it's resistant to water. Typically, I would not recommend lacquer on any kind of a surface that's going to see water because you'll leave a white ring. And uh, of the lacquers that are out there, this is the only one I know of, not that there isn't others, that has some enough water resistance that you can use it in the kitchen. But our kitchen, our dining room table that we made on the online workshop a few years ago, what, what did they put on there, Jake? It was just a hot, it was a paper plate, but it was a hot paper plate. Oh, Yeah. So they, uh, sometimes you have that many kids use paper plates so there's not so many dishes. But the moisture and the hot food sitting on the paper plate on the table left big white round patches on the finish that I'm going to have to redo. They've never gone away. So, and that was, lac that was with lacquer. So if you're in a situation like that, you're going to have to find a product. So I would suspect you're going to have to need a, use a polyurethane finish. Um, the one that I used to use long time ago was called Fuller Plast. I don't remember the manufacturer. I don't even know if it's still available. But I know it was almost like glass in terms of durability uh, once it was dry. It was extremely caustic, so you have to definitely have to wear a mask with it, which you should wear a mask with all of them, and something that has a charcoal filter. That's as good as, as good advice I can tell you in terms of trying to find that product. But it always pays to experiment. Try it on a piece of wood and put some water on it and make sure you don't want to have it. You don't want to find out the hard way like I just did with the table. Frick? Peter in New Jersey says, I really like how boiled linseed oil looks, but I was told it can cause mold to grow. Is this true? Never heard that one. Not, not been a huge fan of linseed oil finish. Um, I only time I ever used it was when we did the, uh, we did the 18th century traveler's chest. And I just found that... Uh, I wasn't thrilled with it. And it was probably, that was probably the reason why I went out and found this tongue oil. I just find it's, I mean, it's got dryers in it and whatever. It's just, a, it's a great product. I'm, I'm not a fan of uh, linseed oil, so I can't, and I've only used it once a long time ago, didn't like it. I've, I can't comment on that. 
Victor Porthos from Mexico said, you called him the other day to thank him for an order and said to remind you that he's on the live episode on Sunday. Oh, yes. I'm supposed to teach sharpening? Yes. So what, what are we supposed to do? He was having a hard time. Yeah, Rob called me on the phone a few days ago and we talked about preparing the blade, the chip breaker, or the hand plane, and he said to write him tonight and remind him of our talk. Okay, so now Victor emailed Ken again, and be, I, I, I remember the conversation. I just don't remember exactly what you wanted me to teach you, and I want to make sure we get it right. So would you please email Ken again and in detail tell him exactly what I was supposed to show you. And I remember talking to you, but I've had a few conversations since then, so some of the details are foggy. Ken, come back to me as soon as you, as soon as you get it. There's a little bit of a delay between me speaking and him here. You should mention that it is important to use a, a mask with a nuisance filter whenever you're using lacquer. Not a nuisance filter. Well, a charcoal. Charcoal, but that's yeah. what it's for. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I said that. So if any... Any anything that has fumes, if you can smell it, then you're breathing something. So we just found these. I think we're going to start carrying these because they're really compact. We use we use uh, everybody in here use masks for Ten. various Ten things. A, like a typical mask. Typical. And the problem is that nobody could find a mask that was really comfortable to wear. So if you think it's bad having to wear a having to wear a n n what? Ninety one. And N91 all day, wearing one of these is even worse because you sweat, sticks to your face. But if you can smell the fumes, there's something that you should be avoiding. So we've gone, we've gone through numerous masks, and usually they're, uh, they're big and clumsy. Thank you. And they obscure your view because they're so f there's big filters on both sides. So Jake, I don't know where he got these, but he found these, and it's really compact. So when you have it on, it's nice to have two straps, and you just pull on these in order to tighten it up. But because it's so compact, you, it doesn't block your view. It doesn't, your glasses don't fog up. And then there's two Watch filters. Yes, there's two filters. I don't know how to change them. Yeah, there's, there's a tab on the inside. How? Turn that tab. Turn this. Oh, yeah, right there. So this filter is, which one's this? It's charcoal. So this is the charcoal filter. This is the one that will filter out. Do I pull it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, so it's got a good seal in there. So this will take care of the organic vapors. And there's uh, the other one you get is just for dust. So you don't need, this would do both, but I think these are a little more expensive, so... If you're just dealing with dust, just get the dust filters. Well, that if you, standard with the dust. Yeah, so you, get, you buy these separate if you're dealing with spraying any kind of a lacquer. And you change your filter when you start to be able to smell the fumes. That's when you know that the charcoal has done all it can do and need to have a new filter. What brand is that? If people want to look them up. Ellipse. Ellipse. We're going to, uh, we're going to add them to our site because I just think it's... Uh, I was, I was really, first I was like, why'd you spend all that money? And then when he I tried it, me all the time. like I say to him all the time, because he spends money like a drunken sailor. <laughs> and then he likes it. And then I like it. Isn't that the way it's supposed to go? Yeah. So that's it. Anyway, I just, I hate wearing masks, period. And I sadly admit that I sprayed way too much finish Without a mask, I said, I'll just hold my breath for a few minutes. That never happened. So now I pay attention to it and I wear a mask. And that is the most comfortable one I have. And what's nice, too, because you don't want these sitting around like that, getting dust in them. comes with a hard case. Everybody's got their own in here with their name on it. Actually, that's yours. Mine's in here. See, I take care of mine. So it goes in the case, keep it handy, and use it. This is one of those habits that you have to get into because if you don't, you, will, you most likely will pay the price sooner or later. Wear your mask if you're dealing with these finishes in particular. That should be on our site sometime soon. How much were they, Jake? Do you remember? 30.
30 plus the uh, and the 14 for the filter. So for 30 with the with just with the dust filter, and if you want the charcoal filter, they're an extra 14. Frick, next. Uh, Alan sent an email. He said, Alan uh, McEwen. McEwen, Alan, whom I always hear from. That's how I know we have a good video. Alan's always the first one to email me. So he wanted to know when you say cherry, what species exactly do you mean? Because he said where he is, they have black cherry, pin cherry, and choke cherry. Well, black, and it's not a very technical term, but black cherry is typically the cherry that is sold commercially. But you know what? I remember Dale telling me that there are 50 species of oak in the United States. There's only two states that don't have one native to them. I think Idaho was one. I can't remember the other one. You'd think Hawaii, but it actually isn't. And those 50 species are either sold as white oak or red oak. So that's why you can get so much variation in the color and in the look. I expect it may very well be the same with cherry, but black cherry is typically the cherry you talk, you think of when you go and buy cherry from a commercial uh, setting. Okay, Victor, get back to me. Okay, Victor. He said, I have a new blade in my Wood River Plain. I prepped them following your instructions, uh, but I can't get to fine shape, thin shaving like you do. I don't know exactly what I'm doing wrong, but I think it's something about the serrated edge of the Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get Jake to get really close with the camera and we'll go through this in great detail to see. So we're going to veer a little bit away from our topic of the night to help Victor down in Mexico. Just before we do that, Victor, any, any more questions, Frick, finished, related? Uh, yeah, John Root in Greenbrier, Arkansas says, do you finish the Cosman workbench? How do you get oil or lacquer into the dog holes? I'm concerned this will act like water on the MDF. Yeah, okay, good question. Uh, just let me tell you. So what we'll do is we'll save Victor's question for the last five minutes. So Ken, if you just kind of flag me at 5-2, and we'll take questions on the finishing topic right up until then. So uh, how do you do that? Inside, so are you talking about the Cosman workbench? Let's come down here, please, Jake. So the, the disadvantage to MDF is as soon as you leave that hard exterior surface, you get into this soft core. In fact, I put my finger down there, you can actually feel it. I typically wouldn't worry about it way down in there, but what you can do is you can take a uh, Ken one-inch foam brush. Cabinet. Here, there. There's none down here at all. You go that way, I'll go this way. See who comes up with one first. Uh, it's probably going to be you. You got, shelf, Ken. you got a one inch? Has to be one inch. <clears throat> Thank you. So if you're going to oil it, you can do it this. Just put oil on the brush and then just spin it down through like that. And you can coat that. Now, if you try doing that with lacquer, the lacquer will eat the foam and doesn't last more than a couple of, a couple of passes and it'll be all gone. Or you can take um, cyanacrylate, which is uh, the, the, the best, I think the best deal when you're buying cyanacrylate, it tends to be expensive, but Tight Bond sells it in larger containers I'll show you. Um, the next time we, uh, the next time we do our live, which will be in two weeks, we may be in our new shop. So I'll be excited to show that to you. So here, buy this tight bond, and it's pretty, pretty um, moderately priced. And this is the thin. And what happens with the thin is that it'll really wick into that MDF. And when it dries, it dries really hard. And that'll protect those dog holes. And actually, I wouldn't worry about it. But the, for the first inch or so, I would do that. Or the oil one will do it as just as well as well. Just running it like that up and down. This, the only problem with this is it gets all over the place on the downside if you don't have something to catch it. And if you get it on your hands, it's gonna be, you're going to be stuck to it. You got to be really careful when you use that. Okay, how are we, Ken, for time? You got 10 minutes left. Okay, so I got five more minutes of questions on this. Make sure that you've, uh, you've put your name in for the draw. 
Thanks to um, Jake and to Ahmed. We've got beautiful half-blind chisels and also to Santa Claus who supports our program and Mrs. Claus who's right there beside him. Has Luther been speaking up? He's been answering questions, yeah. Good. Thanks, Luke. Next. Okay. Next one is... Oh, shoot, I lost No furniture-related questions from out there? Um, I didn't see any. The ones from the chat, Luther's forwarding me, so... Um, do I need to use a tack cloth before applying finish on a plain surface? That's oh, from, oh, 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 oh. That's from Mike Graham in Davenport, Washington. Hi, Mike. I, uh, I used to use tack cloths. I don't use them anymore because even though they're not supposed to, I think they were actually leaving a residue on the surface. I definitely, you definitely wouldn't need to use it on a hand plane surface, maybe on a sanded, but I wouldn't use it even then. I prefer to use compressed air to blow it off and uh, and if I have to, I'll use a piece of paper towel to wipe it and I tend to do it like this. If we're working on a surface that we're going to clean, that we're gonna spray, I'll just leave it right on there like that and I'll just wipe it and then roll it and wipe it and roll it and just keep going like that and, and blow a paper off afterwards if you wanna be able to use it and save that. But I'd say stay away from tack cloths I think, they, I think they leave a residue on. And I remember fish eyes or something as a result of it one time, and that's when I got really suspicious of them. So don't use a tack cloth. Frick? Do Victor's thing, but because by the time you're done that and we do the draw, it's, we're going to be okay. Okay. All right. So, Victor, pay a close attention. Going to get Frick, or Jake right down there. So we're going to go through sharpening a plane blade. I'll take the blade out of my uh, my five and a half. Now, Ken, are you suspicious at all that he might have a blade that's lost its temper out on the end? Okay. So, Victor, we've seen this. I saw this with Lee Nelson. I saw it. I haven't seen it with IBC, but I've certainly seen it with Wood River. I don't know what they do, but in the final grind or something, whether it's excessive heat, which is what would cause it, the temper gets taken out right at the end, and you cannot get the edge to hold the blade. All you got to do is just get the edge to hold the blade. can't get the blade to hold an edge. Oh, okay. Well, some people are see it the other way around. So what you need to do, if I if that was if what I'm going to teach you right now doesn't work, I'm going to suggest you do this. You come over to your bench grinder. Where are you, Jake? Can you see? I don't know how long you're going to stay here. Long enough for you to get here. Come over to your bench grinder. Adjust your tool rest so that well, you're... We also we just did a video on grinding a plane blade. Yes, we did. Yeah, check that out. And just come over here and just literally blunt the edge. Don't have to go back very far. Maybe uh, 64th of an inch is all you got to do. And then once you've blunted it, reposition this to 25 degrees, or at least so that it's putting a 25 degree primary bevel, and then redo your primary bevel until you bring that back to a point. And that'll get you away from that very edge of the blade that seems to have lost its temper. Ken, do you want to teach this? You've been doing it enough. All right, we're going to start on the core stone. I'm going to finish on the fine. Now, it's all about holding the blade. This is like shooting a pistol or playing pool or golf. Your grip determines how successful you're going to be. So the way I do this is I use the hole as an indexing point. So index finger of my, my this is my dominant hand. I'm right-handed. Left, left index finger in there. Pinky, middle, a ring, middle, and this one index finger of my opposite hand. Put pressure evenly distributed along the cutting edge. What I do to tie the two hands together is I squeeze my right thumb between my right index finger and my, pardon me, my left index finger and my left thumb. So I squeeze it together like that. There's what it looks like on the back side. Okay? And I'm just doing this so these two hands stay together. Now, my sharpening station is down low. My primary bevel is big enough and nice and flat or con uh, or uh, hollow ground but even 
hollow ground will provide you with a nice flat point of reference. Find that point of reference, that's 25 degrees. Elevate two or three degrees above and lock it. Now when I say lock it, I mean lock your wrist, lock your elbow, and try to think about and concentrate on moving just from your shoulder. So there's your primary bevel, you're up a few degrees, lock it, do little circles, little circles. If you're doing big circles, you're doing too much swooping like this. But if you stick with little circles, there's not enough movement to throw that off. Now, while I'm doing these little circles, notice that my blade is held on an angle. It's not like that. If it's like that, it's too easy to be exiting the stone. But if you do it like this, you're staying on the stone. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover the entire stone so I don't wear it out in one spot. So I'm slowly rocking heel and toe, moving forward, covering the stone one end to the other. Takes about 10 seconds of work. If you don't do it in 10 seconds, there's a technique issue because the stone will cut all you need to cut in 10 seconds. Feel for a burr. A slight burr, which just means the metal has rolled around and you've created a new cutting edge. As soon as you can feel the burr, always verifying that it goes end to end, corner to corner, step over here to your fine stone and you're going to repeat the process. And if you're, sorry, if you're worried about it, wipe off anything on there that might carry grit from one to the other. I've never had an issue. Same grip, same positioning, primary bevel. The only thing that's going to change, instead of coming up a couple of degrees, we're going to go a few more. Do not exceed 45 or it won't work in the, in the plane. You're up a few degrees higher, lock the wrist and the elbow. Start your little tight circles again. And now you're going to do this for 10 seconds. Tight circles so as not to alter the angle of the blade meeting the stone. Think about light to moderate pressure applied by all four fingers, the same amount. Push just as hard with your pinky as you are with your right index finger. At the end of 10 seconds, without changing anything, simply push a little bit harder on your right index finger for about three seconds. Then release that and push a little bit harder with your left pinky for three seconds. That'll create a little feathering, a little wearing away of the outside corners to prevent what we call plane tracks. As a final step, take your thin steel rule and apply the Charlesworth ruler trick. A friend of mine in England, David Charlesworth, developed this technique back in the mid 70s. Smartest thing I ever learned about sharpening. Put the blade on its back, pull it onto the stone, staying within a quarter of an inch of the opposite edge, three fingers to distribute the pressure as uniformly as possible, move forward and back to remove or deburr, and that's it. Wipe off the moisture, put it in your plane, and try it. Now, if you accidentally got up too high, remember the frog supports the blade at 45 degrees. If you went beyond 45 degrees with either of those bevels, the secondary or the tertiary, what's happening now is the heel. The heel is engaging instead of the toe. won't work. So that, that, if that's a problem, you've got to start over. If that doesn't work and you still have, I like to take my fingernail and carefully run it like that, and it should be just as smooth as silk. If you feel nick, 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 do that one more time and, and spend maybe 20 seconds on the core stone to make sure you're getting below those nicks. If on the second attempt you still have it, then you may possibly have a blade whose temper has been taken out right out there in the cutting edge. And all you have to do is what I showed you on the grinder or go to our grinding a new primary bevel, flatten that off, come in about to 64th of an inch, and then redo it and you should be back into good steel. Now, I'll expect to hear from you, Victor, if that didn't work. All right, everybody, how, how do we do for donations tonight? We are giving away one chisel. One chisel? We're, well, clo we're close to two, we're at 1,700. If anybody wants to change, fix that, $300 more, and we'll give away a second Ahmed slash Jake chisel, half blind. Anything else we forgot, Ken, that we need to wrap up? Don't forget your t-shirt. Are we giving away those? Yes. 
Yeah, we're giving away one of each. The uh, dead cat, Captain's Always Right, and the Naughty Girl. All right, let me just okay. copy the names here. Are you ready? We have uh, we have some people who like to apply for the draw several times, so I just have to delete the duplicates. Uh, one per store. customer. Just one per customer, please. All right, let me just copy these. We have tonight. I think this is our biggest draw ever. Uh, yeah? 755 people. But we only raised... Seventeen hundred. Seven hundred for a Purple Heart project. Mm. Well, after Christmas, it's all right. All right. What are we giving away first? Dave said. Dave said Frost Sugar Loaf is looking to win a chisel too. <laughs> his alter egos. He obviously put. <laughs> no, it's his dog. Oh, Let's his give dog. away the naughty girl first. So if we, if we draw your name on any of these three. You got to get a hold of us to tell us what size you wear. Frick, what size did you wear that night? Small. It's medium? It's medium. It's medium. medium? Yeah. Naughty Girl t shirt for that special one in your life. And the winner of the Naughty Girl t shirt is Tim Anderson in Minnesota. Tim, congratulations. You know him. Captain's Tim. Always Right hoodie. Uh, the, whoops, Captain Always Right hoodie goes to. Oh, Josh Brion. Ah, uh, Josh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Way to go, Josh. Do we have a super, triple extra large, uh, quadruple tall. large? <laughs> we'll get one to fit him. And who gets the naughty girl? Or who gets the uh, dead, cat. dead cat? The dead cat tonight. The warmest garment you will ever wear, I promise. Don't need it. So listen, wait a minute before you draw the name. So I, I talk about this all the time because I'm just amazed how warm it is. So now half the guys in the dressing room playing hockey come in wearing these dead cats and they get it. It is so warm. You do no and, and light, it weighs next to nothing. It's incredible. Who gets the dead cat? Uh, Mike Miller in Tucson. Hey, Mike, Mike asked a question yeah, tonight. He, he asked a question earlier. Attaboy, Mike. If you want one and didn't get one, patsecretgarden.com. Moose will fix you up. All right, so who's getting which Which of the three chisels are we going to give away, Jake? Well, we should let them pick. All right. We're only giving away one? We're giving away one. Okay, so whoever gets it, you get to choose between the, um, the Coco Bolo, the Pink Ivory, and the uh, African Blackwood. Who gets it? The winner is... Gary Gibbons in Marysville, Washington State. Hi, hey, Gary. Congratulations. We'll save the other two and probably add one to it, and we may auction them off on our next uh, on our next episode. We all done? We are. Okay. Thanks to Frick. Thanks to Jake. Thanks to Super Dave. Thanks to Luther. Thanks to Ken. Thanks to did we did Megan ever come on? Yep. Thanks to Megan. Thanks to Rex. Gina. Thanks to Gina. Gina was on. Yep, she helped us with the vets. Thank you, Gina. Appreciate it. Gina, Gina and uh, Pam take care of the packages, and they have been overworked. So big thank you to them. And uh, don't can't forget Ian. Ian's wife is about to have a baby, their first. Ian, Ian, I didn't introduce you to him. Ian actually came to work with us. How long ago, Ken? August. August. August? Ian's a local. He, uh, he, does, he does great work. Glad to have him. All right. See you in two weeks.